And now, welcome uh, uh, Giovanni uh, uh, Gargiulo. Gargiulo. Uh, <laughs> Good one. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, who is going to talk about uh, uh, Play with Prometheus. Um, and yeah, do you... yeah. All right, go. cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, very excited. Um, my name is Giovanni Gargiulo, and before starting, I'm a software engineer. And before starting, I'd like to, I'm sure that in the, in the crowd there are like lots of products guys as well as system engineer. Is there any developers that actually use Prometheus uh, to monitor uh, service in production? Okay, so there are a few of them, yeah. Uh, Any one of you running in AWS, Amazon Web Services? All right, cool. So there, there are going to be like a couple of takeaways for you. Um, so today I'm going to speak about the um, little journey that uh, we started last year uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Guild uh, uh, into adopting Prometheus and Grafana uh, as a monitoring system. So very, very brief introduction about myself. I'm a software engineer. I've uh, been working on JVM languages for the past 12 years, uh, the last two uh, on Scala. Uh, I am part since 2015 of the Guild personalization um, team. And here there are a couple of uh, details on how to reach me on, uh, um, on GitHub and uh, Twitter. A um, very quick history about Gilt. Um, Gilt is a high-end fashion online retailer. So we sell um, very uh, expensive clothes on, uh, on internet at a discounted price. The, the business model is called flash sales. And uh, every day at noon, um, there would be like a very high spike in usage of the website because we would release new products uh, at a very uh, low cost, uh, high discount. So Gilt was initially launched in uh, November 2007. It was a monolithic uh, Ruby on Rails app. Uh, in 2010, when the, the website started to get very popular, we very quickly hit um, uh, a problem in scalability. And this is the reason why we started to break the, the monolith down. And it took quite a few years to get there. We eventually managed to, to split the Ruby on Rails up into uh, pretty much 350 uh, mostly Scala microservices. Um, last year, in 2016, the Guild joined the HBC uh, family, that is a uh, Hudson uh, Bay company to which uh, more um, online retailer uh, shops uh, are part of. There are a few names here, Lord & Taylor, Git itself, Saxo Fifth, uh, and Saxo Fifth Avenue. So the development process in Guild is very, very simple. This, is a, this has evolved over the years, but uh, we eventually managed to get to a point whereby we do sh shorter iterations. So we deliver to production very quickly. We make use of continuous deployment and continu continuous integration. Jenkins is your friend. And in our team, we do not have uh, QA people. We do not have testers. So software engineers, they follow the whole life cycle of the app from development to testing. We do that in production. Uh, and we also look after the operational side of the things. And this is where Prometheus, we'll see in a minute, is, is, is like fundamental. We do testing in production using uh, the methodology of uh, um, Canary in production deployment. Martin Fowler gives a, has a bleaky and uh, a blog about this thing. It's very clear how it is implemented. But uh, for simplicity, if you're familiar with the, con with the concept of autoscaling group, we have two autoscaling groups in AWS that are basically two fleet of servers. The autoscaling group is only, sorry, the Canary autoscaling group is only composed by one instance. That is where we ship the code initially, so version of the code X plus one. And then we start to monitor how the things are going. And if everything is fine, um, depending on how critic the change or the fix is, we wait a couple of minutes or even a couple of days if it's a major change, usually not on a Friday, because we want quiet weekends. <laughs> and once that uh, we are happy with the change, we push one button and the new version goes to the production, uh, production auto-scaling group that usually is like three, four or more uh, servers. On top of it, there's, on top of the two autoscaling groups, there is always an ELB, and the Canary autoscaling group only receives a portion of the production uh, traffic, so that we have really good understanding of what's going on into, into this node. The release checklist, I think, is not any different from the one that you use as well. We smoke test the app, and we check the usual parameters and check the health um, of the service. Response time, request per minute, errors, either on the API endpoint or in the logs. So let's go back a little bit. In 2016, um, in, in Guild, we were migrating uh, from uh, um, an old hosted um, 
uh, version, uh, all the hosting system called the Carpecia into AWS. And back in, in those days, only one year ago, we didn't have like hard rules uh, with regards of um, uh, monitoring and alerting. And we were mostly making use of New Relic. We started also to adopt CloudWatch that turned out to be like very powerful at the beginning, but then uh, we ended up like copying and pasting the, the same alerts here and there. When we wanted to update one, it was a mess to update them everywhere. So there is a lot of duplication there. And with regards to alerting, um, also there the situation was a little bit blurred. We didn't have a clear um, or, um, system. Uh, of course, we make use of PagerDuty, that is one of the most popular on the market. But again, repetition in having new relic, uh, pumping alerts into PagerDuty as well as CloudWatch. With those tools, we had a 10 back then. Um, we really didn't have a user-friendly uh, way of creating custom dashboards as well as custom addresses. You could still do that, but it would be very cumbersome. Um, a couple of times we've been beaten by unreliable alerting. While the false positive may still be okay because you get paged when nothing is really happening, other times you, get paged, you don't get paged when all your services are down. So I don't know if you remember early this year, there was a problem with the, the DNS. All the hosts were down. Uh, sorry, the DNS resolution wasn't working. All our hosts went down for a specific service. New Relic didn't see any error, so didn't page. But thank God we had Prometheus that promptly started to uh, alert because no, no instances were up. And with CloudWatch, I already said that uh, there, are, there is no single place for all the alerts and uh, the, fa the failure of the ROI principle. Do not repeat yourself if you want. But the straw that broke the camel's back um, happened when New Relic started to fail tracing a Scala future, asynchronous computation. So you can see here on the, on the left, there is a graph of New Relic saying that my API is, has an average response time of 1.5 milliseconds. That's, that was definitely too quick for what I think the API was doing. So when we adopt, initially adopted Prometheus and Grafana, uh, you can see that the response time was actually a thousand times lower. And this was actually matching what we had in the log. So I didn't invent anything here. So, we definitely needed something new. Um, and the key things that were driving our decision were based on the fact that the new solution should have adopted a time series and should be designed for time series, should be scalable. In production, we have 350 uh, microservices. If you consider that the average is three instances per service, this very quickly adds up to more than 1,000 instances in, in AWS. Um, percentiles and derived metrics. When you write a lot of, uh, uh, when you instrument your code yourself, you want to be, uh, you want to be very sim simple. You don't want to build very complicated metrics in the code. You want to delay uh, custom metrics and more complicated metrics at a later stage. And on this thing, uh, Prometheus uh, is great. Um, and we also wanted uh, that the, the tool itself would actually. Um, uh, give you the possibility of create a custom and a very beautiful dashboard, or at least would be kind of partner up or uh, working alongside with something else. The decision to, to take uh, was very simple. We adopted Prometheus and Grafana, and we now know very well what those two uh, things are. So what was the, uh, the plan to adopt those two uh, technologies? So in the personalization team, that is only one of the five or six teams that we have in the Gilt uh, office, uh, we wanted to start to evaluate the product. So um, get our hands dirty with the Prometheus suite and Grafana and see how it worked for us. Uh, try to uh, create reusable templates so that, so that other teams could actually adopt the same solution as well. And if, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and if uh, enough teams would have adopted the same thing, maybe end up with the um, Prometheus uh, Federation and a centralized Grafana. This is going to be clear in one second why. So we started from code instrumentation. Um, as you know, there is a Java client for, uh, uh, for Prometheus, but there is a no Scala client. Scala developers are a little bit piggy. We don't like to mix up Java stuff with the Scala stuff. So we decided to write our own code. One of the reasons is that we could pimp my lab, we use the pimp my library pattern, but if we wanted to, if we had to spend time um, in writing code, we wanted to write something from scratch. So we implemented gauges, histograms, and counters. And we, and we released the, 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 the software um, as open source. So the details of the project are here. Um, you can go take a look. Uh, there is the GitHub repo and also a very extended guide. Uh, so takeaway number one, we started to get our hands dirty with the, with the new, newly created Scala uh, client. But uh, very quickly, we ended up uh, writing um, lots of boilerplate code and repeated code. Because we mostly design APIs, REST APIs, and we always had to copy and paste the same um, way of reporting upon uh, 
uh, response time, frequency, and all those kind of things. It's very frustrating and it's error prone. And this could actually uh, slow down the, the process of adopting those technologies in your daily life. So solution, solution is to extend the basic uh, Prometheus uh, Scala client that we developed and uh, uh, provide support for other frameworks like Play Framework that is uh, a framework, a Scala framework for creating, for quickly creating REST APIs, ACA HTTP and HTTP for S. So uh, let's see how the instrumentation works. Um, there are a couple of lines of code here, importing um, libraries, etc. but it's one liner to instrument JMX and be, uh, be reported upon, and this is just literally the jmx.register. Um, it is also as simple uh, to report uh, response time, um, request per minute, a number of errors on all the endpoints of your Play Framework application. Um, Play uh, uses this concept of filters that are basically snippets of code executed around your REST API calls. So we wrap those um, uh, method calls with a Prometheus filter, and we introduce a histogram, uh, a Prometheus histogram to uh, bucket the response time. And then based on those metrics, we also use the Grafana, we leverage the Grafana um, templating engine. And you can see like there are uh, resources as a title of, of every row. This is basically um, a REST endpoint of our API. And for every single endpoint, we automatically generated the three graphs. It's funny because this morning I didn't know about the red rules, um, but we naturally came up with the same solution. So yay, we're doing it right. Uh, we have res a request per second, response time, and num number of errors. Uh, we genuinely don't have errors. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Um, no, no, it works. <laughs> we, we have meta monitoring. <laughs> so uh, the second part again here, we also adopted the, the uh, Prometheus uh, agent, a null exporter for our for our AC2 instances. So on the top, you can see host disk usage and host memory usage. Um, and then, of course, the JM, J, JVM instrumentation, three graphs, these are repeated for every single host. So there is the host ID there. And so how much memory we're using, what is the garbage collector activity, and the thread, thread count. But instrumenting our code wasn't the only one area where we were focusing and we really wanted to uh, make a difference. Um, it's also the Prometheus stack management. Um, if you use AWS, you know that you don't have Prometheus as a service, so use Initially, you start to, um, to manage your, your stack yourself. Um, and at, at the beginning, it's fine, but if you want another, if another team wants to adopt your same solution and start to be cumbersome, you can't just copy and paste the stuff and then it works. And, and the funny part was that after a couple of months that this thing was running, I was showing off with all my colleagues, then the instance crashed and I lost configuration and that. I was like, this, this is not the right approach. So takeaway number two. If you work in a DevOps team, and uh, there are no ops guys, then, then you have to do ops yourself. And you all really want that uh, the operation side of the things, since we already do this with all our services, needs to be simple and efficient. And of course, you don't want teams supporting Prometheus and Grafana in production. They have to develop new features. So what we really wanted was to create a template that could, should have been reusable, customizable, and easy to maintain and upgrade. So lots of, lots of other objectives, but we actually managed to do that. So um, in AWS, there is a feature called the AWS CloudFormation template, where you can describe the resources that the service um, requires, create a template, and then you can, uh, via command line, create and destroy um, uh, templates very quickly. They're called stacks. Um, again, uh, we come up with the, with the CloudFormation template. Um, we open source it is available at the, at the, on the GitHub project there. And how does it work? So the Prometheus Cloud Formation template um, spawns, starts one EC2 instance in which there is a very fat Docker instance running. And inside, uh, via Docker Compose, we have the old Prometheus suite, so Prometheus Server, Alert Manager, um, and uh, Push Gateway, mm -hmm. as well as an instance of uh, Grafana. We separate learning from the past. We learn that the volume needs to be detached. So we also provide an, a, a detached EBS volume where your data and configuration are safely saved. If something goes wrong and the EC2 instance um, falls, you're just going to lose like a few seconds of uh, metrics, and AWS will, will start a new one. Additionally, what you can do is you can provide the GitHub repo and a GitHub token within the same uh, CloudFormation template. And the template will take care of pulling the latest Prometheus configuration every time it's changed. It uses uh, AWS SQS, uh, Simple Queue Service, 
simple Kubernetes service system from AWS, and the fact uh, that the GitHub can be configured to, um, in a web hook, web hook way, to send notification every time you merge a pull request. This worked really well for us because if you want to version control your configuration, have another pair of eye looking after your changes. Um, um, it's a straight there. And the second thing is also share knowledge. If you create a new fancy alert or whatever, other people are going to see the pull request and learn from that. How to manage the cluster is very simple. It takes actually longer to get all the AWS uh, data like VPC, ID, subnet, security groups, etc. Find them in your console and putting into the stack rather than creating the stack. Uh, it uses moving use of um, CloudFormation init and hope to spawn, to start, and all good old make file to create the stack and update the stack. And we also use Docker Compose, so if you want to change the version of Prometheus or to Grafana, you just edit the, the file and you go like, make update stack. And after two minutes, it's all up and running and working. And I already briefly explained uh, how to hook up GitHub and SQS. Another thing that we wanted to do since uh, it, it is a bunch of developers starting this thing is we wanted to share all the gotchas, and the Prometheus is very powerful, but when it comes to integration into, into AWS, there are a couple of things you have to be aware of. So I provided the number of uh, um, uh, Git um, uh, examples on how to configure um, Prometheus within a AWS. What's next? What, what did we achieve? So the first two months, they were the, uh, the, the, most, uh, the most important thing, uh, because we, we, we immediately have lots of traction uh, working on those projects. Two teams immediately adopted Prometheus and Grafana, and the first two months, um, uh, we had already uh, beautiful, friendly dashboards, uh, and the number of services, I think, was between four and five. And the level of alerting was really greatly improved. For the first time, we had warnings and critical. So if something was going bad, but not too bad, we wouldn't wake up developers. We would just um, uh, write on Slack. If it was really bad, we would wake up people. The client library, of which I was talking earlier on, already supported a couple of versions of Play Frameworks. Uh, and there was the first release of the AWS um, CloudFormation template. It, I went to through the two different iterations because the first release wasn't really friendly, while the second one I just released a few weeks ago uh, in occasion for this uh, uh, PromCon is actually much more friendly. Uh, User-friendly should be much easier. One funny thing is that we found out very quickly that uh, uh, we were over-provisioning. So once you start to have like a clear understanding of what your uh, services are actually using in terms of resources, CPU, memory, et cetera, et cetera, you may even find out that maybe you over provision And so if you're familiar with AWS and you're using, I don't know, an M4 extra large that costs hundred of dollars per month, and then all of a sudden you're only using half of it to say, why am I wasting those money? Maybe I'll get a pay rise. Um, so no, you can scale down however you want, never pay rise. Um, um, jokes aside, uh, one powerful, very powerful thing uh, happened in early December. One of uh, another team um, got a big problem with the disk space usage in, in AWS. They didn't have Prometheus, they didn't get paged. I didn't have those alerts that you can see on the right hand side of the slide, and I was like, I want to implement disk uh, space uh, warning and criticals so that if it happens to us, we will not have a downtime. How can I do that? It took literally 30 minutes to install the node agent, uh, the agent exporter on all the EC2 instances, and to write these beautiful eight lines of code. And those eight lines of code, they work for all the EC2 instances we had. At the time, it was like 120, so I didn't have to copy and paste anything anywhere. And uh, there is the five minutes thing there, so um, whoever was presenting and later on, you see, I put the five minutes. Um, as of today, so now we're getting towards the end of the, uh, the, of the presentation. What did you achieve? Four teams have migrated to Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, 20 more services have been fully migrated to it, and we have 60 dashboards. Thanks to the Grafana community as well, it's an amazing product. Uh, the Scala client library now supports the most common um, uh, Scala frameworks, uh, Play framework, ARC HTTP, I mentioned them earlier on. We released the new Prometheus uh, template as well as the federation. And this is the third takeaway. Uh, may, may not apply to everyone, but for the way we work in Guild, we love to give teams extreme autonomy. So. Uh, we wouldn't force anyone to use a specific uh, Prometheus or a specific way of building uh, dashboards. So what we do is um, we have the two teams. We have two example teams on the bottom of the slide, the search team and the personalization team, that they own and manage the same instance, uh, they, their own instance, sorry, of Prometheus and Grafana. And then what we do with the federation, we, prov uh, we provide um, a user experience like a New Relic, where you have a one-stop shop where you go there and you can see the health status or generic matrices 
of all the systems that were that are underlying in the underlying level, hosted by um, sorry, monitored by um, Prometheus and Grafana. We released this thing um, a couple of months ago, and it's been a great success as well. So, what did we really achieve? So, we now have beautiful custom dashboards that really give us um, detailed picture of what's going on on our services, um, and we are very confident when we do production releases. We really know if the new service, uh, the canary, the health, the health status of the poor canary, if it is doing well, if it is sick, if it's dying, and um, of course, uh, production release um, overall reliability as well as uh, uh, um, saving some money when you, you found out uh, that you're over-provisioning. So what is next? Uh, what's next is uh, failover in the CloudFormation template is there, but it's not, uh, fully, it's not fully there yet. We only have one instance, so if we want an active-active or uh, active-passive configuration, this still needs to be implemented. We really love, I would really would love to have this soon. Uh, Meta-monitoring, uh, we have a very simplistic, uh, simplistic way of doing this. The federated distance is uh, controlling the child, and the children, uh, the children and the children are checking their peers as well as the federated distance. Last but not least, many times we, uh, we thought we had delivered a new version of the configuration in production, but because the YAML was incorrect, just nothing really changed. So we would love to integrate prompt tool as well into the uh, GitHub pull, pull request mechanism, and maybe this is going to be done as well in the next few days. This is it. Questions? I hope you're still awake. First of all, thanks for open sourcing so much of your work. And before, uh, no, have you considered um, Carmon for monitoring Scala, Akka, and so on before writing your own uh, um, framework? Yes, we did. We took a very uh, quick look, uh, but the Prometheus uh, use case was fitting uh, so well our requirements and the fact that we were running into the cloud that we decided to, to give it a try and give it a shot. And this actually also uh, fits kind of nicely what, what we have in the roadmap. Uh, we are thinking. Uh, the next few months to uh, adopt Kubernetes as well, and Kubernetes has support for Prometheus like out of the box. So uh, this is one of the reasons why we decided to go for Prometheus. Yeah, but for writing your own framework that exports the Scala metrics? Ah, no, we, we were happy just to write our own, yeah. No, we, we didn't really take a, a deep look into that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've gone up the side. So as you told, like you, you put lot of metrics in your code, uh, which was uh, provided by New Relic, right? Like latencies or RPS, something yes. like that. So what all the stuff you've done, it's now completely removed New Relic or still uh, like New Relic or uh, App Dynamics. Like these are the tools which also give lot of other insights, right? So this, uh, this is a very good question. So at, at the beginning, we weren't sure how well we were doing with Prometheus. So there was a there was a period in which we had both New Relic and Prometheus client running on the same host. And because, of course, we, did, we, did, we didn't just want to switch to the new solution. Maybe the new solution wasn't working and then all of a sudden we didn't have alerting. So it was gradual. At the beginning, we had the new Relic and Prometheus. And then as soon as the confidence and the, uh, of using Pro, uh, Prometheus was increasing, we started to make less and less use of new Relic until we completely uh, dropped the new Relic and we're only using Prometheus with the, with the, the automatic um, reporting that is doing at the REST API calls, plus all the instrumentation that we will uh, programmatically do inside the code but in that case you have to uh, change uh, your code a lot right because you have to instrument everything but these tools like provide lot of things out of box like like how how the call flow will go through in a, in a complete application yes Means where is the exceptions and lot of other stuff right but uh, 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 the two like uh, Prometheus, you just gather the metrics, maybe latency, uh, some numbers basically. Yes. But uh, it will not catch uh, what's the call stack, what all the components are, hits, what all the latencies, right? Yes. So, uh, uh, what's your suggestion on the same? And it, it may sound weird to you, but we had exactly the same fear at the beginning. It was like, ah, oh, we're gonna lose the stack trace if there is an error or the exception or all those kind of things. Um, but whenever we migrated, then we were able to detect the problems at the root, we really didn't need access to the stack trace anymore. So ideally, it would be nice, yes, to have the stack trace be reported as well. But in practice, when we stopped having it, we really didn't feel like we were missing it. So if you're thinking to do the same, I may suggest you to be brave and try to, at one stage, while your confidence is good enough with Prometheus, just 
don't install New Relic anymore and see, and see where you land. If you still feel you need it, you come back and you use. What I'm saying is that maybe it makes sense for you to have both of them, if you really need the good insight as well as the out-of-the-box solution. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we dropped okay, it. Thank you. No problem. I just had the same question as before, so um, it's already answered. Uh, okay. yeah. cool. oh, this one is here. Thank you. Um, what kind of instances, uh, AWS instance types, do you use for uh, Prometheus? So um, initially, I was running everything on M4, uh, large, uh, that is a relatively small instance. Um, that is a not bustable instance. Uh, we found out that it was still over provisioning because we were starting to use also the, the Federation and whenever you install the Federation, Prometheus seems to be working a little bit harder. Uh, but we eventually tuned the, the parameters of the, um, the, the, the frequency of the poll um, and then we noticed that uh, tweaking those values accordingly would actually uh, make much less uh, CPU pressure on the instances. So we've managed to go from an M4 instance to a T2 instance that gives you a um, burstable um, solution. So that if in case, um, for whichever amount of time, one of the instances is working a little bit harder, there is no problem because it's going to burst automatically and provide more computational power. So uh, for all the Prometheus stacks, so we're talking about Prometheus Manager Alert, sorry, Prometheus Server Alert Manager, and the Push Gateway plus a Grafana instance. It was all in the same VM, sorry, all in the same EC2 instance, and it was a T T2 large. And, and did you have like any additional latencies because you're using uh, EFS? And no, not really. Uh, the, those instances are EBS optimized, uh, so the, 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 the transfer rate on the, on the volume is actually really high, and we are using SSD instances. Yes, SSD, sorry, SSD uh, volume uh, types that are really, really faster. The one used for the database, and they're unbelievably performant. Uh, we wrongly configured the, the spinning disk. I can't remember what's the acronym in uh, in, um, in AWS, but we had the major problems because at times, if there was some sort of reindexing or something, like it promised it would become completely unresponsive, but that wasn't an issue on our part because we configured the stack badly. Thank you. Uh, in relation to the earlier question about Camon and Akka, if you're looking to monitor those, uh, Workday has open sourced something called Prometheus Akka, which will basically provide similar instrumentation as Camon does, but for Prometheus. This Camon doesn't quite sync up with how Prometheus works, but also if you want to use Camon stuff, and uh, Monsanto have a library for that. Uh, what's your retention period for the data? Um, so we started with 15 days, and we at the moment pushed to 30 uh, days, but we will soon uh, try to um, take a look at how to persist the data after 30 days uh, somewhere else and have access later. Um, at the moment, at the beginning, it was really uh, one of our problems because we had the bigger fish to catch at the stage. But uh, as soon as like you start to adopt and you say, oh, it would be nice to see how the system has been done after the 15 time span, 50 days time span or 30 days, uh, we started to think about that as well. And definitely going to save uh, the, the, the data somewhere else for a long term uh, management. Inquiry. All right. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you very much. Ah, one more question. One more question. One more short question. Yes. Uh, it's not a technical question, but uh, it seems interesting to ask: How much time do you spend to convert your formal system to the new one? Like, how do you would quantify the effort? So, um, th th this was one of the points of the the presentation. So, at the beginning, the plan was only one team starts to work on this thing, and uh, I was working on this on on the Prometheus and Grafana integration for 25 percent, 50 percent of my time between November and December. But once that uh, we created the Scala library as well as the cloud formation template, everything um, started to spin off very quickly because. Um, all the repetition, all the boilerplate was already nicely wrapped up somewhere so that if you wanted to spin yet another service and start Prometheus from scratch it will, and instrument it from scratch with Prometheus, it would come basically for free. But if you were migrating a, a service, I would have recommended my uh, colleagues to have, as I was mentioning earlier on, both New Relic and Prometheus running on the same service. And then with the time, 
trying to replace all the new Relic instrumentation or CloudWatch instrumentation with the Prometheus instrumentation. So if one day you ask me, like I have 6,000 line, uh, line of code up and I want to scratch new Relic and I'll start with Prometheus, well, that is gonna take probably a couple of weeks time if you do that in one go. But if you gradually go from one to the other, it should be much, much faster. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks.